Cool. All right. So for those of you who have not been in a class with me before, um, I am Dr. Veronica Red. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, feel free to call me Red or Veronica or Doctor or Doc or Dr. Red. Um, I'm happy with all of those things. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, network analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the concepts behind network analysis first and some case studies that I've been a part of. Um, and then uh, we're going to do some hands-on keyboard, play around with the um, package in R called iGraph. Um, so that'll be the last thing that we do. Um, and we'll spend a bunch of time doing that because I feel like me just talking at you in class is stupid <laughs> and I won't do it. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about using social network analysis techniques on all different types of data. And, um, and before I do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a, what a network is. So networks have a bunch of different components. Um, so networks can either have nodes or vertices, and we're going to talk a little bit about what those are, um, and they can have edges. Now, a node or a vertex in a network is the thing that we are studying, and the edges are the connections between those things. Um, basically, if you have a different type of, each different type of network is called uh, what it is based on what you are studying and uh, based on the um, type of edges and type of nodes there are. We're gonna talk a little bit about some network statistics, including degree, betweenness, and path length. And then we're going to talk a little bit about graph partitioning. And we're gonna do all of these things in iGraph today. Um, so after this class, you should be able to do all of these things on any network data that you would like. So. So the parts of a network, um, we talked a little bit about nodes or vertices already. So generally, um, nodes or vertices in a network are the things that are connected. So if we were studying a group of people who are friends, the people would be the dots in this case. And generally when we are graphing a network, network, um, the nodes are represented by dots. This is why they're also called vertices. Now, the edges, like I said, are um, the connections between these dots or between these nodes. Um, there are different types of connections that you can have in a network. You can have a undirected, unweighted edge, like this blue one here. You can have a weighted edge where that particular connection has a higher priority or a higher weight um, than other connections in your network. So that particular line, for example, is thicker because there is a higher weight on that edge between these two dots than it is the weight between the edge with, on the edge between these two dots. And there are directed edges. Directed edges are exactly as they sound, they have a direction. So if we're talking about networks like Twitter, for example, um, in Twitter, uh, you can follow someone and they don't have to follow you. So that edge between you and the person that you follow is directed because it's not coming back the other way. We usually when we use undirected, uh, edges. We use undirected edges specifically for mutual uh, relationships, such as um, if two people are friends, for example, um, if two people are related, 
uh, that thing is mutual between the two people. You can't have one person related to someone and that other person not related to the first person. Or like on Facebook, um, for two people to be Facebook friends, one person has to send a request and the other person has to accept it. So both people have to say that they're friends. Now, um, there are many different representations of networks. Um, they can be represented either by a matrix or by an edge list. And a matrix generally is like looking at um, a bunch of columns and rows in Excel. Uh, you have all of the different nodes on the horizontal axis. So all of the different, if all of these dots were people, we'd have names of people on the horizontal axis and we'd have names of people on the vertical axis. And then every single box that was between two names would hold the number that represented that connection. If we have just an undirected, unweighted network, our matrix is going to be symmetric, which means if we look across the diagonal, uh, if we folded it on the diagonal, each both would mirror each other. Um, if it was undirected, that would mean, I mean, I'm sorry, if it was unweighted, that would mean every time we have a connection between two people, we would just have a one in the box that corresponded with those two names. And if they weren't connected, we'd have a zero. So that would be an undirected, unweighted network. If it was weighted, however, we'd have a number that represented the weight. Now that weight can generally, generally when we have weighted networks, that weight is represented by a number between zero and one. And so all of those uh, numbers are uh, between zero and one, but you can also represent the weights by uh, integers. So that, that, and that has been done in many places as well. Um, if it's directed, however, when you fold on that diagonal, um, you're not gonna get a mirror image between the two sides of the, the matrix. Now, that matrix is one way to represent a network. Um, an edge list is the other way. Um, and generally, an edge list has three columns. It has, the, the first column is node one, the second column is node two, and the third column is the weight, the edge weight. So node one, meaning the first um, one side of that edge, um, node two being the other side of that edge, and that third column, the weight, being that number that would have been inside that block in the matrix. Now, um, data, uh, if you want to look at very, very large networks, generally those are held in edge lists because edge lists are a lot easier to store on computers than matrices are, uh, especially if you're looking at a dense matrix. A dense matrix can take up a whole lot of space when you're looking at a very, very large network, whereas an edge list is only three columns and as many rows as we need. And for those of you who know anything, who have worked with Excel, you know that the maximum number of rows in Excel is a lot larger than the maximum number of columns. Right? Cool. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about some network statistics. So if there are three different statistics that I wanna go over. There is degree, path length, and betweenness. Now degree is the total weight of interactions for a node. So if we have an undirected, unweighted network, degree is just the total number of connections that a particular node has. So if we look at our, um, this little orange node over here, this orange node has more connections than any of the other nodes in our network. And therefore, it has the highest degree. Even though this node here is connected to a higher weighted um, edge, it still doesn't have the highest degree in my, our network here. 
Now, had this, had this node been connected to three, these three, these four edges that are, um, had they all been weighted higher than other edges, that node might be the one that has the highest uh, degree in our network. But again, degree is just the total weight of interactions of a node. And you can calculate that generally by taking either a row sum or a column sum of your matrix, of your adjacency matrix. Um, but we can also calculate it nicely with uh, a function in um, R that we're going to play with in a little bit. Um, path length is another network statistic that I'd like to talk about, and that is the average number of steps along edges required to get to all the other edges or all the other nodes from a particular node. Now, the shortest path in our network is this one because of the highest weight, so that's our shortest path, but the node with the largest path length in our network is this green one over here. Can anyone tell me why? Is it because it's disconnected? Exactly, because it's not connected to anything. So it has an infinite path to every other node in the network. Now, generally, when we calculate path length, we try to leave isolates out because of that infinite path length. Um, but what we generally do, what we will do for networks a lot is to calculate the average path length of the network or the average number of steps it takes to get from one node to every other node in the network. Now, the final uh, statistic that I'd like to talk about is betweenness. And so betweenness is the number of shortest paths that must pass through a particular node. Now, this yellow node here, because it is connected to both this group, this click of nodes, and this other group of nodes, it is the node with the highest betweenness. It is the node that all of these nodes have to pass through to get to the other side of the network. Now, the last thing I said I was going to talk about was graph partitioning. Um, graph partitioning is uh, taking our network and splitting it into groups of nodes that are more connected to each other than to the rest of the network. It's also called community detection. Um, it's something that I do a lot. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do with network analysis because it allows me to take this huge amount of data in a network and split it into smaller groups. Um, basically, it works a lot like clustering in machine learning, except for community detection optimizes something called modularity, which allows us um, to define, to run community detection and not have to define the total number of communities. The algorithm finds the number of communities itself. Whereas if we use clustering and machine learning, for those who know about it, um, you have to tell the clustering algorithm how many uh, clusters you have, and that's how many it finds. Now, one of the things that I like to do a lot with my community detection is to take my communities and compare them to some sort of um, uh, some sort of descriptor about each of the nodes. For example, if I have, if this network is all um, people in a Facebook group, for example, um, maybe I know everybody's um, neighborhood, like where they live. Um, and I might want to see if people actually group in fringe groups by the neighborhood, for example. I would use something called a similarity score to compare my communities or my community uh, uh, my, my community labels to my neighborhood labels, for example. 
And I'm going to be able to show you how to do this in R Studio as well. Now, before I go into uh, the code, I want to talk a little bit about some case studies that I have done um, because I want to show you that like network analysis techniques can work on any types of data. Um, I've looked at a bunch of social networks, including Facebook, prairie dogs, and ants. I've also coerced a lot of data into networks, including uh, congressional co-sponsorship, uh, belly button fauna, and countries and infectious diseases. Um, people from uh, grad school or people who have knew me from grad school um, will recognize most of these projects because um, these were all done during my PhD. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about them so you can get an idea about how versatile network analysis is. So one of the projects that I worked on um, was on Facebook users. So back in 2005, um, we were able to get a data dump from Facebook for the top 100 schools. And when I say 100 schools, I mean 100 colleges, universities, um, because that back then you needed a .edu email address to get onto Facebook. Um, so we were able to get the top 100 schools from Facebook, each user, and four different uh, pieces of information about each user and who they were connected to within, both within their school and to one of the other 100 schools. Now what we did was we took each of our students or each of our users and we created a social network from them based on who they were connected to. We then colored each of our nodes in this picture by a specific aspect of their life. Um, for this particular network, this is Caltech. And I don't know if anyone who is on uh, the call has ever been to Caltech before or went to Caltech as a student. Okay, well, Caltech is a little odd um, in that when you first go to Caltech, um, you have to choose a particular uh, house to live in or like a particular dormitory to live in and you have to live there all four years. Um, and then they have contests between dormitories like in Harry Potter. So it would make sense that your friends are probably all the people in your same house, your same dormitory, right? So what we did was we used community detection which found the groups of uh, students who were more connected to each other than to the rest of the network. And then we colored each one of these dots by dormitory. And you can see that each of these communities are mostly one particular house or one particular dorm, right? Now, um, for most of our schools, most of the 100 schools, um, we were able to find that the communities mostly matched graduation year instead of house. But schools that did something to change the social structure, like Caltech, changed the way that their social network worked. Does that make sense to everybody? Excellent. All right, so that is one way to use uh, social network analysis. Makes sense because it's an actual social network. I have also worked on this amazing project with uh, Dr. Jen, who's also on the phone, um, about prairie dogs, uh, where we took um, data that uh, Dr. Jen collected um, about Greek kisses between prairie dogs for three different prairie dog colonies. Um, and the information about how uh, social groups are traditionally defined. Um, and then we used community detection on these networks where each of these, uh, each of these shapes are a particular prairie dog and then each of the lines are Greek kiss interactions between them. And these networks are actually weighted because the more interactions between two uh, prairie dogs, the thicker the line here. 
Um, we then did community detection and then compared our communities to the original social group assignment. And we found that communities were a significant match to our social groups. Um, the cool thing about this is that uh, finding communities required a much smaller amount of data than the creating social groups. And knowing which social group a prairie dog is in is really important to prairie dog health. Um, Jen, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure, yeah. So what people might not know is, is that prairie dogs suffer from plagues. So thinking about how disease moves through that population and it is a challenge that people have had and we can, you know, start to maybe get at, you know, can more connected, well, will the disease move faster in social groups that are more strongly connected to each other and how does it move across groups? And from the picture, you can see there's definitely some individuals that it was between this, right? Have a higher between this. And so they're going to be kind of these super spreaders. Um, and ironically, we're kind of in a, a human uh, social network situation right now where, you know, we're being asked to reduce our social network to halt or put the brakes on, on disease transmission. So, so there's been some, you know, interesting um, work trying to understand that in prairie dogs, but also uh, really, you know, being able to spend, you know, maybe 40 hours instead of a thousand hours um, <laughs> to try to figure out who, who's with who um, and what are some of the features that define those groups. This has been an invaluable tool and, you know, really um, fun to work on uh, with Dr. Red. Awesome, thank you. Um, yes, this was an amazing project and it, uh, we're still working on stuff together, which is awesome. We are. So another uh, social network that I worked on specifically had to do with ants. This was during my PhD. I studied Formica subsericea, um, which are, uh, for those who are in the DC area, um, you can still see them running around on the sidewalk. They're the big black ants that run around and look like they're drunk. Um, these are not carpenter ants. These are the ones that are, uh, they're called wood ants. They're their common name. Uh, just because they live in the woods. But um, for each of our, uh, for the Formica subsericea that I was studying, I looked at antenation networks. And so when these ants, specifically Formica subsericea, when they interact, they do something called antenation, which is rubbing antennas together. Um, to rub, when they rub antennas together, they're basically smelling each other's bodies. Uh, because ants communicate by putting hydrocarbons on their bodies, or at least these, uh, this particular species does. And so rubbing those antennas, was, they were able to send messages to each other. And so I looked at how antenation participants for three different sizes of networks um, reacted to when a queen was present and when a queen wasn't present. Um, for those who don't know about ants, um, Formica subsericea is one of the species that lives in very large colonies, um, usually over 10,000 workers. Um, in ant species, um, the workers are um, non-reproductive females. And then in the, in the colonies, you also have a queen. And you generally also have uh, drones, but drones in the particular colony, and drones are considered male. Um, Drones in a particular ant colony, uh, generally for Formica subsericea, are being uh, fattened up for mating season. Um, so they're not they're not reproductive inside the colony they're in. They generally fly away and uh, reproduce with a queen and then die. Um, so I looked at antenation networks for three different sizes of of networks. Uh, with three different sizes of groups, uh, with a queen present and without a queen present, um, calculated all of the network statistics that we talked about earlier, um, and compared those statistics for the networks with a queen and without a queen, 
And it seemed like the queen really did not affect how they talked to each other, which was very, um, which is very surprising to me because I expected that the queen giving uh, off pheromones because the queen does um, would affect how they communicated. And it didn't. <laughs> um, so those are the three types of social networks that I've, uh, I've done work on. But I've also done some coercive, um, co coerce, bleh, coercing data into networks. So one of those uh, projects was on congressional co-sponsorship. Um, so in Congress, there are lots of bills and each bill has to have co-sponsorships. So whenever there was a bill that had multiple people that sponsored it, um, from the 96th to the 108th Congress, um, we, um, this was a, a project that I worked on at UNC. Um, we put, it, put together connections between um, uh, Congress people who co-sponsored bills. So if there were five people on a bill, they were now all connected because they all co-sponsored it together. We then uh, made uh, weighted networks from this. So if they co-sponsored multiple bills uh, together, they, were, they had multiple connections to each other. We then, then found communities um, and measured the polarization of our networks with modularity. And you can see that basically each of the networks split kind of right down the middle with uh, whether people were Republican or Democrat. All the blue here obviously are Democrat, all the red are Republican, and then we have one little green independent. But generally, um, the, uh, the split in polarization of, our, of Congress was um, the polarization increased uh, dramatically from the 96th to the 108th. So 108th, they were more mixed up together about um, who co-sponsored what. And at, when we got to the 108th, it was just, it was exactly split Democrat to Republican. So the community detection was able to split our network into parties. Which makes sense, right? Because nowadays when you look at uh, bills that are being sponsored in Congress, generally they're all being sponsored by one party. Or that they're, each bill is being sponsored in total by one party. Maybe they have an extra person on that uh, sponsorship, but generally uh, if a bill starts in Congress, it's probably gonna be all co-sponsored by Democrats or all co-sponsored by Republicans. Okay, another project that I work on, worked on was belly button fauna. Um, so there was this amazing project that was going on at NC State. Um, in the um, evolutionary biology lab, um, people were going around and swabbing people's belly buttons and then um, going through and figuring out what the bacterial incidence was in, in each person's belly button. And uh, I was given all of this information uh, about each belly button and the bacterial incidence. Uh, basically each of the different strains of bacteria that were held in each belly button. And then I created a network of belly buttons to other belly buttons based on the similarity in bacterial species. So it's a weighted network here because the more, uh, more similar to belly buttons were the, um, the higher, the, the thicker the line. And I then compared communities to some lifestyle variables about people. Um, I found that community detection always split the belly buttons into two groups, but I couldn't find a significant match to lifestyle data. I did find a little bit of correlation to how much, to specific uh, bacterial species and whether uh, people had a dog, but not a whole, not any significant match to lifestyle data. Um, including gender, which I like to say, belly buttons don't care.
And finally, the last project that I want to talk about is countries and infectious diseases, which is a little apropos for now. Um, but um, this is a data set that I was able to pull um, on a, a infectious disease incidents in all countries. And then we converted this incidence matrix into networks of countries based on the infectious disease incidents. So if two countries both had the same infectious, both had an incidence of the same infectious disease, they were connected. And the more diseases they had in common, the more they were connected. I then found uh, communities from these networks. And I used the communities to validate clusters. Um, and then I use these clusters to dictate regions. So you can see the like different colors here. Each of these colors are based on regions that uh, came from community detection. And we were able to find a very significant match between the clusters and the communities. So um, when I say clusters, I, we also did clustering on our um, on this bacterial uh, or infectious disease incidence matrix, um, and uh, compared the clusters that we got from clustering to the communities that we got from community detection, and then we were able to correlate all of our clusters and all of our communities with many variables, which include GDP and species richness, which makes sense, right? So if uh, if multiple countries have the same amount of same GDP, they're probably going to have the same uh, in incidence of infectious diseases, right? Generally, they don't have people in power who are really, really terrible. Um, but generally, yeah. Um, and then if there is a high species richness, right, in a, in a particular set of countries, um, they're generally going to have a higher incidence of uh, infectious diseases because they have more possibilities. If you have a higher species richness, you have lots more possibilities for infectious diseases. Make sense? Okay, cool. So before we go into coding, I would like to ask if there are any questions. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no, or people don't uh, realize that they're on mute. Okay. So we're going to go through and do some uh, network exploration in our studio. So I hope everybody who is on the call has our studio. So everybody can put hands on keyboard um, and be able to play. Okay, I think most everybody does. Um, if you don't, I have another video on uh, YouTube uh, that has an introduction to R and R Studio, how to get it, how to install it, and some basics in, uh, in R and R Studio. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, the iGraph um, library. So the first thing I want to do is I want to install this package. Now, I already have iGraph installed, but I would like to get the updated version. So I'm going to go ahead and type in install.packages of iGraph, and iGraph is in quotes. Is this uh, text size big enough for everybody, or, or should I make it bigger? Okay. 
Okay. I think I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger just in case. Okay. So I'm going to install uh, iGraph. So basically for anyone who doesn't know a, a lot about R, you can use this install.packages to pull down any package in the R CRAN, uh, which is a big giant repository of packages. Um, R is open source, so all of these packages are free and generally well kept because all kinds of people will uh, try to play with these packages and find the problems with them and submit corrections and stuff. So generally um, anything in the CRAN is, is really good. Um, and there are packages that will basically do anything you could possibly want. So we can install iGraph using that install.packages uh, function. We can also go to the packages tab here and click the install button and type in the package that you want to install. Okay, so now that we've installed iGraph, the way that we want to uh, load iGraph is to use the library command. We can either use the library command or we can go to our packages tab here and look for iGraph in the list of packages and click the little checkbox. This will do exactly the same thing. Now when you in, uh, when you load iGraph, you can see that there are a couple of things that are masked from um, our original packages in R, our base packages in R. Uh, the decompose and spectrum commands in the stats package and the union command in the base package. Now the union command for us will, um, in the iGraph package, will union two different graphs together if we wanted to add them together. Um, whereas the original union command was for data frames. If you would like to know more about data frames and about um, how the base stuff in R works, you can see the other YouTube video that I have um, about introduction to R and R Studio. Okay, so I've created this R notebook, um, an R markdown notebook for exploring network data. So we're gonna do a little bit in there and then we're gonna do some, just some playing. Um, I, uh, when you, uh, you can either load the iGraph package using the library command, or you can use the require command. The require command is nice because it will install iGraph if you don't already have it. Now, for those who are new to R, to get help with anything in R, you can type in a question mark and then the name of the package or the command that you would like to get help with. And you'll get this amazing documentation to show up in this bottom uh, right corner. This tells you all about the iGraph package for R. And this is the package that I swear by for using, uh, for doing network analysis. Um, it has everything I could possibly want, including all of the community detection algorithms that I like as well as all of the statistics that we've already talked about. It also has a bunch of um, creation uh, functions that will allow you to create graphs. So we can take graphs um, and in iGraph, a network is a graph. So we can take, um, any of these uh, functions for creating graphs, we can create graphs both from uh, random um, using a bunch of different uh, distributions uh, for the, um, for the uh, number of edges. We can also create graphs from an edge list or a data frame or an adjacency matrix. So remember we've talked about an edge list and we've talked about an adjacency matrix. Um, data frame is also very, uh, very similar to using an adjacency matrix or an edge list. Um, and we can look at any of these functions by just clicking on them here and we'll go to that documentation. The iGraph package also allows us to load in 
graphs from particular files. So I have uh, downloaded some graphs that I found online already. Um, Dr. Mark Newman is one of the people that studies, uh, net has done a ton for the network analysis field. Uh, Dr. Mark Newman um, has a bunch of network data on his website. Um, he's at University of Michigan. Um, in fact, let's look him up. So Dr. Mark Newman does a lot. Um, he was a physicist, or he got um, got some degrees in physics, but his website. Where? Where is this? Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So he's got a list of publications and courses and stuff, but also um, there are plenty of, um, there's plenty of network data, collection of network data sets. So there are a ton of different network data sets. Most of these are in GML files, um, which are graph, files. And that's what I've, I've downloaded a couple of these. Um, I've downloaded the power grid. I've downloaded the dolphin one and the American college football one. Yes. And yes, uh, our Markdown notebooks are very similar to Jupyter Notebooks and Python. Okay. Um, the only, uh, sorry, I am just getting to the questions that were in the chat right now because I wasn't able to see them while I was uh, in the presentation. Um, a colony um, wouldn't, there is one time when a colony wouldn't have a queen is when the queen is dead. Okay, and I've put the link to all of the network data into the Zoom chat. Okay, but there are a ton of different networks that you can pull down. Um, we are going to play with the three that I've pulled down in our studio. But before we do that, I want to create a couple of graphs from the uh, graph creation functions that we have in, in our, our graph, iGraph. Now, since I've created a notebook, um, I can just hit this play button here with the code that I've written. I've created a tree graph. 
a star graph, a ring graph, and a lattice graph. And you can see what that's a star, a ring, I'm sorry, that's a tree, a star, a ring, and a lattice. Was there a question? Please feel free to ask questions out loud. Um, and so you can see a tree graph, um, you give it the number of vertices and then the number of um, secondary vertices, the, the, the five here. So 30 is the total number of vertices and the secondary number is that secondary, that secondary degree on that second um, after that first star. For our star graph, I gave it, I told, told it I wanted to put in 30 nodes and that the center was number five. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. So are we supposed to be able to type that command in and do that? Because it doesn't, like, is there so a, di a different step if, if iGraph is running and you type in tree graph equals make tree and then you run that, uh, it, it should create it? Exactly. Okay. So if you put that in your console, that tree graph equals make tree, you should then have a tree graph or a, a variable called tree graph listed in your environment. Okay. And if you don't, then what might you be doing wrong? Do you get an error? Yeah, it says error in tree graph equals make tree blah, 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 object tree graph not found. I see, and you went ahead and used library, use the library command to pull in iGraph. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, uh, it gave me the, uh, you know, uh, masking decomposed spectrum and union. Gotcha. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious, but I mean, it, it doesn't have to be solved now, but. Um, well, why don't, why don't you uh, share your screen with me so we can see? Okay, let me um, figure out how to do that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a green button on the bottom. That's oh, yeah, button. there it is. Okay. Share. Oh, there it is. Our studio. Okay. So, right. I'm like right here. Okay. And then I get the, this error. Oh, okay. So, uh, but, so you're trying to run the entire thing, I think. So okay. if you just uh, select the tree graph line. This? Mm hmm And hit the run button. I still get the error down at the bottom. Whoops. Ah, okay. Can you uh, make it? Because I can't quite see the bottom. Okay. So let me see. Hold on, let me make it bigger. <laughs> can you can you see the bottom now? Yes. Okay, okay. cool. Um, okay. So can you copy and paste that tree graph equals? Because right now is what's happening is it thinks it's part of another command. Okay. Because this isn't a notebook, this is just a um a dot r file. Oh, okay. So I could you take out that title and output bit. bit. Okay. And so if I have this, if you just copy that and put it in your console, you should be able to run it. Oh, there you go. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. No problem. No problem at all. <laughs> cutting on the fly is that that's the, the uh, dangers of cutting on the fly, which is, but I, I love cutting on the fly because we get all of the errors and I get to help correct them. And, okay. um, 
it's cool. Thank you. No worries. All right. So if we have our tree graph, we can then plot it using this plot command. Plot of tree graph, comma, vertex size equals three because I want my vert vertices to be small. And I don't want any labels on my vertices right now. So I'm saying my vertex.label is equal to NA. And that is how I got uh, this plot here. Now these are a bunch of different random graphs that you can create um, by telling it just how many vertices you want um, and other uh, small pieces about the, the network. For example, in our tree, we said we wanted it undirected. Um, so the edges that we are shown here are just lines instead of arrows. If we hadn't used the undirected command, we would have gotten a directed graph and there would have been arrows going out from this uh, center node to the ones uh, further down. We also created a star graph, which basically just has one node in the center and then all the other nodes are connected to it as if it were a star, for example. Um, we put in the number of nodes we want in our network or the number of vertices, whether we want it directed or undirected, and then which of the nodes is our center. So right now I've told it that number five is my center. If you want any more information on any of these, all you have to do is type in question mark, make, and you can see that you get a lot of um, options here. So if we do a make ring, which is what I use to make the ring graph here, you can see that that first parameter in make ring is uh, that first parameter in make ring is the number of nodes in our network. And the second is whether it's directed or undirected. Um, then we look at whether uh, we're looking at whether directed edges are mutual and whether it's circular. So a non-circular ring is generally a line. Whereas we didn't put anything in uh, or we said circular equals true to make it a circular ring. Also, once you do question mark make ring, you'll see that um, underneath all of the documentation, there's a bunch of different make commands um, for a bunch of different types of graphs. So you can make a full graph, you can make a lattice, you can make a tree, you can make a star, just like we have already done. And you can see the lattice here is just like lattice work on a fence, for example. So in our lattice, we have uh, 30 uh, vertices. Or I'm sorry, we have 30 by 30. So the, the length we have is the size of the lattice in each dimension. So each side is 30 nodes. So we've got a 30 by 30 network here. And it's just connected just like, um, just like a, uh, like a chain link fence, for example. You've got a vertex, each vertex um, has a line vertically uh, up and vertically down and horizontally to the right and horizontally to the left. So each one has um, four connections here, except for the ones on the very edge.
So the cool thing about being able to make these graphs is that each of these graphs have um, information about them that is known. And so you can create these graphs and be able to run some code on them um, and, get, uh, and get back information that you already knew so you know that the code you're running uh, works, for example. Okay. Now remember I said I had um, three different graphs that I downloaded um, from Mark Newman's website. They're all in uh, GML file formats. We had a few people who have to leave, um, but uh, we'll, we'll continue going and um, uh, the video, when it's, when it's finished, I will be posting it on YouTube anyway. So anyone who wants to go back and re-watch and everything is very much welcome to do that. Um, so the three different graphs that I downloaded from the uh, Mark Newman website were the power grid, the football graph, and the dolphin graph. So let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and load in the power graph. using the read graph function. Now in my read graph function, I've got this really nice command called file.choose. Now file.choose is one of my favorite things in R. It opens up a file browser so I can go find a file that I need on my computer and not have to remember the entire path. This particular file that I'm looking for is on my desktop and I have already uh, navigated to it here in my files um, window. So what should open is this particular window, but it does not. So we are gonna go find it. I will be busy then. You're doing good, you seem a good boy. I'm sorry. Uh, Cricket, did you have a question? Nope. Sorry. I just realized I wasn't on mute. No worries. Okay. So I've gone into my data folder and I'm looking for the power one and I'm looking for that .gml file that I downloaded. Now I've told the read graph function that I'm pulling in a GML file. You can now see that I have the power graph here. And if I click the little arrow next to power graph, power, you can see that it's an I graph. I can also type in the word power and hit enter and get a bunch of information about my graph. So you can see that it's an I graph it's undirected. Um, it has 4,941 nodes and 6,594 edges. Um, so it has an attribute for all of our vertexes called ID. And then it gives you a list of some of the edges. We can also go ahead and plot this network. And I'm gonna do that using this command that I've already created for the football network. I'm going to take out this vertex.color. So the, the uh, graph name is power. I'm saying that I want my vertices to have a size of five and that I want the label to be 50% of what is um, normal for label size, what is default for label size. And I'm gonna hit enter. And then the plot of my graph will show up here in my bottom right, um, in the bottom right section of my RStudio. Now this particular graph is very large, so plotting it takes a little bit. Uh, 
Now you can see because this graph is so large, the labels kind of all squish together. All of my little dots are orange. So now that we've created a graph, we can do all of the different um, statistics and math that I already talked about. So let's go ahead and uh, look at the degree function. So remember, I talked about degree. Um, degree is the total number of weighted interactions that a particular node has um, in our power graph. This is undirected and unweighted. So um, this particular graph, if we calculate the degree for a particular node, that would mean that that would be the total number of interactions or the total number of connections that that particular node had or that particular vertex had. So we can say, I'm going to say D equals degree. I'm going to use my power graph. And I don't actually have to put in anything else. But I am going to use the mode uh, parameter here and tell it I just want the total. Now, this particular graph is undirected. So this, this parameter is actually going to get ignored. But if this graph was directed, for example, um, the total would then find me the undirected version of the degree. So now if I look in my environment, I have a, a vector called D. And this is all of the different, the total number of connections for each of the different nodes in my network. You can see that we can use the max command to find that the power plant that is connected to the most power plants is, uh, has 19 connections. We can find the minimum, and that's one connection. We can find the average. So the average degree for this network is 2.67. So that, that one um, power plant that has 19 connections is way, way different than average. We can also look at the distribution of these uh, degrees by using hist command to create a histogram. And you can see the dis degree distribution for our particular, for our power plant um, uh, network is very skewed. It's very skewed to the right. meaning most of our um, power plants have very low numbers of connections, but there are a few that have very high. Now for reference, most networks, especially most real world networks, are going to have a degree distribution that looks like this. Almost all degree distributions are right skewed. If you have a social network, if you have a coerced network, almost all of them are gonna have a degree distribution where you have most of your nodes are gonna have a few connections and there are a few that have a bunch. Now, when we were talking about um, the prairie dog networks earlier, um, Dr. Jen was talking about super spreaders. So there are two different ways to potentially be a super spreader. One is to have a very, very high degree. And the other was to have a very, very high betweenness.
Now that we've calculated degree, let's look at between us. Now you can estimate between us in a graph. Um, remember we talked about path lengths, um, all, which are also known as geodesics. So the betweenness for a, a vertex or an edge are defined by the number of shortest paths going through that vertex or an edge. So we only talked about node betweenness, which is what I'm going to calculate. And we're going to put in our power graph. And it's not directed, so we're going to put in false. And calculate our betweenness. Now, you can see that our betweenness is another vector, just like our degree. It has the same number of things in it. And the reason it has the same number of things in it is because we calculated a betweenness and a degree for every single node in our network. And in this particular one, the power network, we have 4,941 nodes. Now for betweenness, the maximum betweenness for our power network is really big. 3,518,477. We can also look at the distribution of our betweenness, which is also very right skewed. And generally, for social networks, um, this is also going to happen for your betweenness. Betweenness is generally going to be right skewed. Now, if you create a network such as a ring or a lattice, that betweenness is not going to be right skewed because each of your different um, nodes have a certain number of connections. And they're placed in a certain structure. But real world, world data generally doesn't come in that certain structure. Now, real world data generally has uh, certain nodes that have high numbers of connections and certain nodes that have low number of connections. And they will have these nodes that sit in between, um, that basically are gatekeepers between one side of the network and the other. We talked about degree and betweenness. Let's do path length. Hmm. No, that is not what I wanted. distances or shortest paths or all shortest paths. All right, so distances is actually what I wanted. So we can use the distances function here on our graph, our power graph, and calculate all of the different shortest paths for each of our different, um, each of our different nodes. Now, this is not a vector. It's a matrix. Why might this be a matrix? Is that because it's a new matrix of the distance of each node from each other node or something like that? Exactly. Exactly. So what we are now calculating is the length of the shortest path 
between each node and every other node. It's a very, very large matrix, so it may or may not let me view it. It's coming. Um, but yes, so it's going to give us a matrix that is the number of nodes by the number of nodes, which in our case is 4,941 on each side. And then the values in our inside each of our squares uh, represent the length of the shortest path from each um, from each node to every other node. Ta -da! So we can see that the maximum uh, length of shortest path is 46. Now, 46 um, in a, a shortest path length means that to get from one side of the network, from this, from the node, from one node to every other, um, the, the 46 means to get uh, that. It, there is a maximum distance from one node to get to another specific node, and that's 46. So you have to get go through 46 other nodes to get to that node. Now that the maximum here is 46 tells you what? Well, if, if I did the maximum and the maximum was infinity, what would that tell me? That would tell you that everybody is isolated. Well, not everybody is isolated, but at least somebody is. Okay, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah. Because I'm taking the maximum of the entire matrix. So like there could be one that is infinity and it's, it's an isolate all by itself. Um, but since our maximum is 46, we can see that we don't have any isolates in this network. Okay, and you can see that our minimum here is definitely zero on the diagonal. Uh, the histogram of the... The histogram of the, of the path length. It's not skewed like the other measures. Let's see. Well, we've got uh, there, there's two possibilities here. The reason, part of the reason of this is that we are looking at a matrix instead of a vector. So I'm not 100% sure how histogram handles a matrix instead of a vector. Um, but uh, our matrix here is also symmetric because you can see we've got um, this 15 here and the 15 here. So the path between node one and node two, uh, the shortest path between node one and node two is 15. Um, the diagonal here is zero because it doesn't, you can't, you don't have to go through any nodes to get to yourself. Um, if we simply did the histogram, for one node, we should get a skewed uh, distribution for the histogram of a shortest path for one node, but that uh, skew is not going to be, um, it's not going to be right, uh, it's not going to be right skew just like the degree or the uh, betweenness. It's going to be um, centered around a particular 
um, number based on where that node is placed in your network. Because we're looking at the path lengths to go from one node to every other node in the network, you're going to get a bunch of different distances. And because you get that many distances, you generally um, are going to um, see a more normal distribution. Law of large numbers, unfortunately. Okay. All right, so we've done a uh, path length, we've done betweenness, and we've done degree. We've pulled in uh, graph data um, using uh, GML. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about how to do community detection. So I'm gonna stop displaying. Thanks, that is taking up a lot of my RAM. And I'm gonna type in communities. Now, communities is an object type in uh, iGraph here. Um, it is what is spit out by a bunch of different community detection algorithms. Um, and iGraph has a lot of them. You can see all the different methods for finding communities listed here. There are many different ones. Generally, I use uh, one of two. I use cluster Louvain. I'm sorry, one of three. Cluster Louvain, cluster leading eigen, and cluster fast greedy. Excuse me, cluster Louvain and cluster fast greedy are pretty fast on very large networks. Um, cluster leading eigen is very good for small networks. So I generally use one of those three, but um, label propagation is really cool, um, as well as walk trap. Uh, both of those are based on, so walk trap is based on um, running, letting a random walker walk across your network to figure out um, communities. Now that takes a really long time for very large graphs, so I definitely wouldn't use uh, walk trap uh, specifically um, on large graphs, but I would, but it's lovely on very small ones. Um, label propagation is about the same. Um, label propagation is kind of like watching a rumor um, fly on the network and see where it, uh, it sticks. Or, or watching something like um, uh, an infectious disease propagate through the network. Um, it will start sticking in little places that have uh, small uh, clicks or clusters that are highly connected to each other. And that's um, what will end up getting its own uh, community, for example. Uh, but let's go ahead and play with one of these. I'm gonna use the cluster of fast and greedy. on the power network. And you can see we now have a communities object here, which has a bunch of different pieces. And if you want to get to any of the different things inside your com, Com's object here, um, you can use that dollar sign just like you would use for a data frame. The thing that I wanted to look at was the membership. Now the membership vector here, it gives me the uh, community number for each of the different nodes in my network. You can see there are a lot of them in community six and community nine and 30. We can also use the, the V count 
um, which will tell us how many nodes are in each one of our communities. Now, remember our specific uh, network was 4,941 nodes. And if you look at the V count, the V count has 160 things in it, which means that our particular community's vector um, or our particular uh, community algorithm has now given us 160 communities. But we can also um, see that by looking at the unique of um, membership. I'm sorry. No. It only gave us 40, 40 communities. Okay. Um, sorry, they must have, they have changed how vCount works in the community structure. And it's not in the documentation. Okay. Well, if we use the unique command on our comms dollar sign membership, we get the total number, each of the different um, community numbers. And you can see that if we sorted it, we get one through 41. So we've got 41 different communities here. We can also use the communities when we graph our network. So if we go back to our plotting command, I'm going to take these vertex labels out. Or we can use our communities object on our power graph. And you can see that what we've got when we plot it are groups of nodes that are more connected to each other than to the rest of the network, and they're highlighted by little colored circles. Now the power graph is very large, so it's a little hard to see communities here. But let's, let's pull in the uh, football graph instead. And play with that one. All right, so our football graph, we have a bunch of different uh, nodes here. Each one of these is an American college and the edges are whether they played each other. And you can see that the value here is the conference that they're in. Um, so the dots are all colored specifically based on their conference.
And if we did community detection on our nice little football graph, see that we get six different communities here. And we basically get each one of our conferences. Cool. No, oh, sorry, I didn't color the notes correctly. Give me a second. Okay, so we basically get each one of our conferences, but some of our communities have a couple of extra conferences in them. Um, like this purple one here has three or four different conferences in it. Pink one has two. And it's probably schools that go and play a couple of different places in another conference. Now the final thing that we haven't done is we haven't talked about how to do similarity scores. So let's do that. Go back to my console. So similarity me uh, measures, uh, basically measures the similarity between two vertices or two sets of vertices. There are a couple of different methods. You've got jacquard similarity. Um, jacquard is very, very similar to rand similarity, which is what I talked about in, um, in the slides. You've got dice similarity. I think we also have a rand command though. Pairs. That's what I wanted. The compare command. Okay. So, um, the way that the compare compare command works, um, specifically in iGraph, is it takes in two different community membership um, variables. So what you'll have to do is to create a communities object of your um, specific uh, information about your nodes, for example. To create a communities object, all you, have to all you have to do is use the communities function. All right, so for our football graph, for example, We've got a value piece of information for each of our, our uh, schools here. Now that value happens to be which conference that school is in. So I wanna use that value information to create a community's object. So 
to do that, I believe we just use the communities function. And we'll use football. Since we want something that is a, a, a aspect of our vertices, we use that V um, of football that gets us everything about our vertices. And we'll use a dollar sign and the value. And that pulls out that value information for our each of our vertices in our football network. I'm sorry, what? Did I do it wrong? Oh, that should work. Did I spell it wrong? Obviously, doing data science isn't magic, um, and sometimes things change. And as a data scientist, you have to learn to um, figure things out on the fly. But communities should. Allow me to create a communities object. Make clusters. That's what I was looking for. All right. So instead of using the communities, I want to use clusters. And let's go ahead and see how that make clusters command works. Ah, I'm going to put in the graph first. Football is our graph. The membership is our values. Okay, why? All right, let's look at our values then. Oh, we've got a zero. Okay, that's why. All right, so we're gonna change this by adding a one so that we no longer have zeros. We can't name a community a zero, so I have changed it so that they're, that the bottom number here is one instead of zero, and we've just added one to everything. So now we have two different sets of communities and we can use that compare function to compare 
Because F to C2. And we get 1.269. And the method generally looks like it's variation of information, but we can also use the man the rand method. And if we use the RAND method, we're going to get a number between 0 and 1. Um, the higher the number, the closer the match between the two uh, communities. This is why I generally use RAND. You can see that the, the comparison between the communities that we have for our football conferences and the communities that we were able to um, pull out using uh, the um, fast and greedy uh, community detection algorithm match pretty well. All right, so now I'm just going to open the floor for questions. Okay, so I have a question. Sure. Uh with the comms F where we got the six communities, what was that based on? Like what attribute was it based on? And then what exactly did we compare it to with C2? <laughs> okay, so C2 was the conferences for okay. each of our different football or each of our different uh, colleges. Oh, right, membership into the conference, right? Right, so like, what was it? Um, I, I don't follow football, so I can't remember what the conferences are, but like I know UNC is in one conference okay. and like UCLA is in a different conference. Okay, so that was C2. We made it a whole set of communities basically based around membership and compared it to communities that were made based on connections. Based on so, yeah, okay. so that comms F was what we calculated using that uh, fast and greedy community detection algorithm. Got it. Okay. So we found okay. groups of schools that were more connected to each other than to the rest of the network. Well, then that makes sense, right? Because schools are going to play together in the same conference. Exactly. Got it. Okay. That's so cool. That's all I got to say. <laughs> are there any other questions? Okay, well, I want to make sure that everybody knows that even people who have been in data science for forever have trouble remembering uh, what different uh, functions do and get errors all the time. So please do not get frustrated when you get errors um, because that just happens. It happens all the time. I mean, I got multiple errors because I couldn't remember the name of the function that I wanted. Um, and I do a lot of Googling, um, a lot, a lot. Um, so please don't, please don't get discouraged. Um, I also wanted to uh, let everybody know that the video is gonna be up on YouTube uh, probably late this evening. Um, so if you need to rewatch it for any purposes, it'll be there. Um, please feel free to share it um, to anyone who might want it anyone who contacts you saying that they missed class and they wanted to see what was happening. Um, again, all of the uh, uh, networks that I downloaded are all on Mark Newman's website. Um, you can also pull in data from uh, like a CSV file. Oh, uh, what, what's up Cricket? I think you're muted. Uh, or 
Oh, the link. Um, let me go ahead and put the link in here. Oh, the YouTube link. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you just look for Veronica Red, um, that's the name of the channel, and I'm the only one. So, okay. The I had another question. If you pull a CSV file into a graph, will it automatically read it? Um, so, the way we would want to do that is we would want to use the read graph function. But let's go ahead and. Um, open. We have a bunch of different formats if we're going to read a graph. But what we want to do um, is generally we'd want to make a graph from a data frame. And sorry, and I meant a typo. I, I, I meant if we pull in a, a CVS, a CSV file that's a matrix into iGraph, will it automatically view it as a, a matrix instead of a GLM file. So the way we'd want to do that, if you pull a CSV into R and you have a matrix, you then want to use the make graph function. Or we want, let's look at the make graph function because I believe it was there. or within the make graph function. Right. Graph from adjacency is what I'm looking for. It's also a graph from data frame. There we go. Graph from adjacency matrix. So if you have a matrix, all you have to do is use this graph from adjacency matrix function. You just put in the matrix, tell it what kind of graph it is, and it will automatically create an iGraph um, object for you. So the matrix is just the square adjacency matrix. Now, if you have an edge list, you can also use graph from edge list. You can also use graph from data frame. So let's look, look at that documentation because that's pretty cool. So generally what you'd wanna do to create a graph from a data frame is um, you need uh, two different, or I would generally have two different data frames. The first one being the edge list with the first column being the first node, the second column being the second node, and the third column being the weight, and any other edge attributes in that uh, particular um, matrix or in that particular data frame. So if you had, uh, for example, um, information about different types of edges, um, say you were doing a network of the population of an island, like Malawi, for example, you might have different types of edges. You might have edges between people who are related, edges of, between people who are married, edges between people who are friends, edges between people who are dating, um, edges between um, potentially edges between enemies. Um, and you would want to know what each different edge uh, represented. So you might have an edge type as a column in this data frame. So you have an edge data frame which is gonna have the node number for one side of the edge, the node number for the other side of the edge, the weights, and then any other edge attributes. You would then have a data frame for, each no for the nodes, where each row in the data frame was for one node. So the first uh, column would be the node uh, number or the node ID. And then you would have all the different um, attributes about that node. 
Um, for example, uh, if we were talking, again, if we we're talking about the people in Malawi, we might have uh, identified gender, we might have um, economic status, we might have um, location on the island, we might have, um, I don't know, hair color, skin color, um, whether they were born there or not, um, uh, what, what they do, what, their profession, for example, age group. Um, these are all different possibilities for information about each node, right? And so when you create a graph from a data frame, you're actually creating a graph from two different data frames. You're pulling in the vertex data frame, which is just an edge list. And then, I'm sorry, you're pulling in the edge data frame, which is just an edge list, and the vertex data frame, which gives you all of the information about the vertices. And then you, just, and then you tell it whether your graph is directed. Now, when you use graph from data frame and you have a weight um, column in that data frame that is for the edges, it will automatically know that your graph is weighted. Now, this is really, really cool uh, because I've done this a lot. I've cr had an edge list where I had just um, the, the node from, node two, and the like, or node one, node two, and the weights. But then I have this data frame of information about all the different nodes. For example, uh, for the colleges that we had, we had information about the conferences. So we have a bunch of different information about each of the different nodes in our network. And then we can use, we can put both of those together and then they're in our very nice graph object like the football one. When we type in football here. You can see under uh, attributes, we have ID and it says V slash N, which means this is an attribute specifically for the vertices or the nodes. We have a label, which is V slash C, I'm sorry, V slash N, uh, because vertices are nodes and numeric. So our ID is numeric here. Our label, V slash C, um, because the V is for vertices and C is for character. So our label is character. Um, and our value here is V slash N because it's a, a vertex attribute and it's numeric. If we then had another attribute that said, that was called, I don't know, um, type, for example, and in the parentheses, it would have E slash C. E is for edge. That means that attribute was an edge attribute, not a vertex attribute. And C is character, because if I was going to create a type, I would make it a, a letter, for example. If your network here, for example, was weighted, um, you would have another uh, attribute called weight. And it would also have an E inside the parentheses, but it would be E slash N because it would be an edge attribute that was numeric. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. I'm going to stop uh, recording then. Um,